might be surprised to learn that the Second World War caught the German Navy unprepared. When Hitler decided to invade Poland in 1939, the German Navy had only 24 battleships. In accordance with the armistice agreements Germany had signed at the end of the First World War, which placed severe limitations on German military forces. Great Britain, Germany's main enemy during the first years of the war, was an enormous empire with the world's largest fleet, over 300 ships and ports all over the world. Even so, the small outgunned German fleet managed to strike painful blows to Great Britain by aiming directly for its soft underbelly. The Germans almost succeeded in cutting off Great Britain's shipping lanes and thus its supply of fuel and raw materials. The credit for this success belongs to the German flotilla of submarines, the Unterseeboots, or U-boats in English. Great Britain and its allies, mainly the U.S. and Canada, had to contend with the German U-boats in a constantly changing technological environment. The battle between the Allied fleets and the German submarine navy serves as a prime example of the important role that was played by science and technology in determining the outcome of World War II. Hi, and welcome to Curious Minds. I'm Shoshi Shmulevitz. Today's episode, U-Boats and the Battle for the Atlantic Ocean, Part 1, The Rise of the U-Boats. This episode is sponsored by Augury. Augury. Machines talk. We listen. Augury's technology is called predictive maintenance. It's built upon a simple principle— Every mechanical system produces unique sounds and noises. By attaching sensors to machines, Augury software can analyze subtle changes in these sounds and diagnose and predict future malfunctions before they occur. This analysis is done in real time using a smartphone. Augury is growing and looking for great engineers and developers who share their same passion and creativity for smart technologies. Has anyone ever told you that you're the smartest person they know? If so, Augury wants to get to know you. Visit cmpod.net and click Augury's banner to submit your resume for positions in New York or in Haifa, Israel. Carl Dunitz enlisted in the Imperial Navy in 1910, and during World War I, he served as an officer on a battleship in the Black Sea. When the ship was dry docked for repairs, Dunitz was stationed on land as the commander of a small airport in the Ottoman Empire, which was allied with Germany. Dunitz, who was a highly motivated officer, was bored with his new posting and volunteered to serve in Germany's submarine fleet. In 1918, he received his first command of a submarine, but not for long. Only a month later, a British battleship sunk his U-boat, and Dunitz was taken prisoner. After the war, Dunitz returned to Germany and served in its armed forces. He quickly climbed the ranks, and by 1939, he was given command of the entire flotilla of U-boats. Like the rest of the German Navy at the time, it wasn't in great shape. In fact, the armistice agreement at the end of World War I didn't allow Germany to have any submarines at all. Under the guise of academic research and cooperation with other nations, the German Navy had continued to develop the technologies necessary for a fleet of submarines. But even so, when World War II broke out, Dunitz had only 57 submarines, and less than half of them were actually seaworthy. In addition, almost no one, either in Germany or in Great Britain, believed that submarines would ever play any significant role in marine warfare, and they believed that for two reasons. The first was their experience during World War I. During the first half of the Great War, German submarines did manage to damage British battleships and merchant marine ships that were carrying essential equipment and raw materials. But 
as soon as Great Britain began organizing its commercial shipping in convoys rather than each ship traveling on its own, the submarines became far less effective. A lone merchant ship was easy prey for a submarine, but a crowded convoy escorted by armed battleships was a harder nut to crack. The Germans lost 178 U-boats during World War I, more than half their entire fleet, without managing to significantly disrupt the British lines of supply. The second reason was the invention of sonar, a new technology that the British developed in the interwar period. Sonar can locate a submarine by sending out a pulsed sound wave and then listening to the echoes returned by the sub's metal shell. Sonar deprived the U-boats of their main advantage, stealth, and that threatened to make them irrelevant. But as we have already learned, when World War II broke out, the German Navy was far inferior to that of Britain. And so it couldn't break through the British siege of Germany's ports. So marine combat by submarine was really the only option that Germany had. And if their numerical inferiority wasn't enough, the U-boats suffered from serious technological problems. During the first few months of the war, there were several occasions when German subs encountered British ships and launched surprise attacks, only to discover that none of their torpedoes even worked. Some of them would pass under the hull of their target, others would hit the side of the ship but then fail to explode. It took a long and comprehensive investigation for the engineers to find the reason for these malfunctions. The fuses of the torpedoes were overly sensitive to high pressure. They finally resolved the problem, but not before a bunch of quality control officers were court-martialed and thrown into the brig. So in the first months of World War II, the German U-boats didn't have much effect on commercial shipping in the Atlantic. Furthermore, the number of new ships that the British put into active service each month far exceeded the number of ships that the Germans managed to sink. The turning point came in June 1940, when Germany occupied France. Until then, the German U-boats had access only to the North Sea, forcing them to make the long and dangerous trip to reach the Atlantic, where the actual naval battles were taking place. The occupation of France gave the Nazi fleet access to ports along the shores of the Bay of Biscay, a wide body of water leading directly into the Atlantic. And so that really shortened the distance that the U-boats had to travel to reach their targets. The U-boats had enough fuel to stay underwater for longer periods of time, and so Karl Dunitz, the commander of the fleet, intended to prove to his naval comrades that his crews were going to turn the tables and do far more damage to Britain's armed convoys than they had in World War I. The tactic that Dunitz chose to employ was called wolf packs. The Germans had already tried the wolf packs method during World War I. Several U-boats would congregate around a convoy of commercial ships and attack all of them at once. Such an orchestrated attack would throw the convoy and its armed escort vessels into panic and confusion as lethal torpedoes sped towards the ships from every direction. It was a great idea, but only in theory. In practice, it called for precise coordination between the U-boats to ensure that they didn't get in each other's line of fire during combat. The U-boat commanders were fully occupied overseeing the operation of their vessels, so it was up to the commander on shore, who saw the complete tactical picture, to conduct the symphony and make optimal use of all combat resources. During World War I, wireless radio transmission wasn't advanced enough to allow communication over such large distances, and the wolf pack attacks were unsuccessful. But by World War II, the communication technology was more developed, and Carl Dunitz believed that would be a game changer. The U-boats now had better, stronger radios, and the antennas operating on the shores of France enabled the shore commanders to communicate with those at sea. 
The German fleet also had a powerful encryption device called Enigma. Enigma looked sort of like a typewriter, but inside it housed an incredibly sophisticated system of disks and gears that converted the words that were typed into a code that, at the time, was thought to be unbreakable. All that new technology enabled Dunitz to conduct his Wolfpack tactics the way they should be done. In less than a month after the German occupation of France, the situation in the Atlantic changed dramatically. A German sub that spotted a British convoy would transmit an encrypted message to the onshore commander, who ordered all U-boats in that area to set up an orchestrated ambush on that shipping lane. The U-boats attacked simultaneously on cue from the shore command, sowing death and destruction. In some cases, the wolf pack sunk a third or even half of the ships in a convoy. Now, the losses in naval combat are usually measured in tonnage. That's the total weight of the enemy ships that each side managed to sink. Before the occupation of France, Germany had managed to sink a monthly average of 80,000 tons worth of British ships. After July 1940, that number would reach upwards of 230,000 per month. The U-boat crews called the months following the occupation of France the happy time. The sudden German success caught Britain with its pants down. The British were totally convinced that the Germans wouldn't dare attack with subs not after their dismal failure during World War I. And as a result, they were woefully unprepared. In 1935, four years before the war broke out, only 11 out of over 1,000 British naval officers were trained in anti-submarine warfare. Even sonar, the revolutionary technology that the British were sure would win the day, turned out to be inadequate. Sonar was only effective against the subs when they were underwater. When a sub was on the surface, the echoes of the audio signal it returned were distorted and a U-boat could only be detected at a very close range. Lucky for the Germans, their U-boat hulls were well suited to sailing on the surface. So that's where they spent most of their time, diving only when necessary to flee their enemies. The U-boat commanders traveled on the surface under the cover of night and thus managed to take the British by surprise time after time. The German command was pleased with the unexpected success of its fleet of U-boats. Hitler ordered the shipyards to immediately speed up the production of submarines. Karl Dunitz became one of the most admired officers in all the German armed forces, and during the war, he rose to command the entire navy. His meteoric rise was partly thanks to his well-known anti-Semitic zeal and his ardent support for Hitler and the Nazi party. And he wasn't alone. Many of the enlisted men and ranking officers had radical far-right views and had eagerly welcomed Hitler's rise to power. It's not hard to understand why the German people had nothing but admiration for the U-boat crews. They represented the values and ideals that Germans wanted to see in themselves. Patriotism, unity, courage, and technological superiority. The living conditions in the crowded and claustrophobic submarines, 50 men living together in a space the size of three train cars, made it hard to simply maintain a daily routine, much less face the grave dangers they faced week after week, both in combat with the British and when braving the turbulent storms of the Atlantic Ocean. In a submarine, even a simple task like flushing the toilet could be potentially lethal. At least one of them sank when a sailor failed to operate the flushing mechanism correctly and seawater flooded the batteries. The commanders of the U-boats were even more admired. The commander was the only man looking through the periscope during combat, so he bore the sole responsibility for the safety of the submarine and the success of its attack. Daring and fearless commanders became well-known celebrities in the same way that successful pilots did and crews on leave were generously pampered with gourmet meals and dances, and women would fall at their feet. 
CM Pod is proudly sponsored by Outbrain. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably used Outbrain today. You just didn't realize it until now. Outbrain is the service that recommends which stories to check out next when you're browsing your favorite sites. Didn't know there was a service for that? Ever wondered why you see the stories that you see on sites like CNN, ESPN and People magazine? It's because Outbrain uses algorithms to figure out what you might like to see next based on your interests and other readers like you. So the next time you reach the end of a story on your favorite site and you're thinking about what's next, remember, Outbrain thinks of that for you. Outbrain, we could all use a little direction. Visit outbrain.com for more info. The British were suddenly under tremendous pressure. The wolf packs hit the supply convoys time after time, threatening to cut Great Britain off from its overseas colonies. The Americans had not yet declared war on Germany, and not even the enormous British fleet could protect the convoys over the vast distances of the Atlantic. Desperate, the British asked Canada to help protect their convoys, at least on the western side of the ocean. As part of the Commonwealth, Canada was one of Great Britain's natural allies and had joined in the war effort right from the beginning. Canadian soldiers had fought in World War I and suffered heavy casualties, most of them on land. Unwilling to face a similar fate in this war and preferring to remain a freestanding Canadian force rather than be swallowed up in the British Army, the Canadian government was more than happy to agree to this request. But there was one problem, and not a minor one. Canada didn't have a navy. To be exact, Canada had six destroyers, but they'd been attached to the British fleet as soon as the war broke out. In other words, every Canadian who knew the first thing about commanding a battleship was already on the other side of the ocean. The Canadian shipyards went full steam ahead in building new ships, but still, there was no one to command them. Volunteers from all walks of life enlisted in the Navy. On most of the new ships, there were only four or five sailors who had any experience at sea at all, most of them in the Merchant Marines, along with another 40 men who had never before left port. The instructors at the Naval Training Centers were forced to accommodate the demand, and even students who had failed every test were posted on combat ships. After all, better a cadet who had failed the course than one who had never even signed up for it in the first place. In less than a year and a half, the Canadian Navy grew 50 times over, from 1,800 sailors to almost 100,000. To put that into perspective, the American Navy increased only 20-fold during the entire war. This unanticipated growth obviously took its toll on the performance of the ships at sea. One Canadian officer wrote in his memoir that, quote, at the beginning of the war, most of the new ships were not at all functional. Some of them barely managed to leave port, and if they did make it out to sea, they needed a lot of luck to find their way back, end quote. One popular anecdote tells of a senior officer who saw a ship making a particularly inept maneuver. He sent a furious message to its commander. What the hell are you doing? The response? mostly learning. These novice sailors were thrown into service under particularly difficult conditions. The Canadian government didn't have the budget to build large destroyers, so it approved a crash building program for a corvette, which was essentially an improved version of a whaling boat. The small corvettes, only 60 meters long, rocked like walnut shells in the high waves of the North Atlantic and their crews suffered terribly from seasickness. The ships were slower than destroyers. They were equipped with minimal and obsolescent armaments, and they had to do combat with the skilled and experienced crews of the U-boats. People say a lot of things about Canada, that they could have adopted British culture, French cuisine, and American technology, but instead chose American culture, British food, and French technology. They say Canada has only three seasons, almost winter, winter, and still winter. 
they say the Canadian summer is the nicest day of the year. But no one can deny this one thing. They don't give up easily. Between 1941 to 1943, the Canadian Navy played a significant role in the battle for the Atlantic Ocean. The Canadians provided escorts for approximately 35% of convoys, and they were active participants in over half of the naval battles. Canadian corvettes sank close to 50 U-boats, and they did so at high cost to themselves. However, the Canadians do not often receive credit for their part in the war. Both the British and Americans essentially regarded them as a bunch of undisciplined amateurs. But in hindsight, we know that the Canadian Navy played an essential role in the battle for the Atlantic. And they did that despite the severe disadvantage they started out with. Nothing can take the place of courage and determination, but luck also plays its part in war. On the 27th of April, 1941, the British got lucky and things took a turn in their favor. That day, the U-110 U-boat attacked a convoy in the North Atlantic, east of Greenland. The attack was a success, sinking three merchant marine ships. But unfortunately for the submarine, it was spotted and pursued by two destroyers escorting the convoy. The U-110 was hit badly, and its commander decided that all was lost. He ordered the crew to surface and abandon the ship. And here's where the British got really lucky. The U-110 was carrying an Enigma encryption device. German Navy procedures regarding the Enigma were clear. The commander must ascertain that the Enigma device has been destroyed before abandoning ship to prevent it from falling into the hands of the enemy. In the case of U-110, the commander was sure that it would sink at any moment and that the Enigma would go down with it. He jumped ship with the rest of the crew and began swimming away. But a few minutes later, he noticed the sub was still afloat. And that's where it clicked. He'd made a terrible mistake. So he started swimming back towards the U-boat. But before he could get there, he was shot and killed. The British boarded the ship, found the Enigma, and immediately knew what they had on their hands. For a while, the capture of U-110 was kept strictly confidential, even from their American allies. The Enigma was delivered to British intelligence and Alan Turing and his group of code breakers at the Bletchley Park facility succeeded in breaking the German code. By intercepting transmissions from the U-boats, the British could guide their convoys between the packs of subs lying in wait for them. And if a U-boat was detected, the convoy's armed escort vessels would attack it with depth charges. Depth charges were the Allies' main weapon against U-boats. What are they? And how do they cripple a submarine? Here with me to answer these questions is Ron Levy. Hi, Ron. Hi, Shoshi. So what are depth charges? A depth charge is a barrel of explosive that is dropped or thrown over the side of a ship and set to explode at a predefined depth. When the charge detonates, it creates a shock wave that can break open the submarine's hull. But for this kind of catastrophic damage to occur, the charge would have to explode very, very close to the submarine, 12 feet or less usually. And since depth charges are dumb bombs and were fired blindly, the chances of an actual direct hit were close to none. However, there is a secondary mode of damage which can render even a near miss potentially destructive. At the moment of the explosion, the burning hot gases quickly spread, creating a zone of high pressure and a shock wave. When the gases cool off, the pressure in the detonation area drops rapidly. At some point, the pressure of the surrounding water becomes higher than the pressure inside the detonation zone. This causes the gas bubble to implode, and this implosion creates a second, less intense shock wave. Both these shock waves hit the sub in rapid succession, one after the other, causing the metal shell of the sub to alternately stretch and bend like a spoon in the hands of a skilled magician. And much like the spoon, 
the accumulative stresses of stretching and bending weakens the hull. If enough depth charges are dropped near the submarine, the many smaller shock waves can ultimately cause the metal to split and rupture. Thanks, Ron. So, the large number of battleships that the U.S. provided to Great Britain, together with the practical experience gained by the British and Canadian crews as they contended with the submarines, brought that so-called happy time of U-boat activity to an end. The number of successful German attacks plunged and Admiral Dunitz was forced to reconsider his strategy. In December of 1941, the United States entered the war and Dunitz recognized a golden opportunity. He sent his U-boats to the eastern coast of the U.S. to attack ships moving north and south, parallel to the coast. Unlike the British and Canadians, the American crews had no experience with submarine warfare and they underestimated the threat that the U-boats presented. Only troop carriers were provided with escorts and protection. Merchant ships continued to sail alone. This mistake extracted a heavy price. Within seven months, about 600 merchant ships were sunk in the area between North America and the Caribbean islands. This was the second happy time of the German U-boats. Once the Americans began traveling in convoys to protect their merchant ships in the eastern basin of the Atlantic, Carl Dunitz redirected his attention to the middle of the ocean. Reconnaissance aircraft posed a significant threat to the U-boats during daylight hours, forcing them to operate only at night. But the middle of the Atlantic Ocean was an enormous area, and there were no Allied patrol aircraft there, since land-based planes couldn't fly that far. This area, known as the Air Gap, was a perfect hunting ground for the wolf packs. And from the beginning of August 1942, the U-boats mercilessly struck the convoys. Dunitz now had about 350 U-boats in active service, and up to 40 of those subs would launch a concentrated attack against a single convoy. The Germans also modified their Enigma devices, so Britain could no longer decode their communications and intercept the transmissions between the U-boats and their shore command. March of 1943 was the most successful month of the German U-boat fleet during the entire war. Dunitz's crews sunk 120 Allied ships, while only losing 12 German subs. Allied losses in the Mid-Atlantic were so great that this was the only point at which Britain's leaders feared that they might lose the war. As Winston Churchill wrote in his memoirs, quote, the only thing that ever frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril, end quote. And if that wasn't enough, Dunitz had another card up his sleeve, a new kind of submarine that would change the face of the naval combat arena. This U-boat was said to be faster, stealthier, and more dangerous than anything the Allied forces had encountered. And we'll talk about this new submarine and other technological advances that would ultimately determine the outcome of the war at sea in the next episode, part two of the Battle for the Atlantic. That concludes this episode of Curious Minds. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to the show. You can find links to iTunes, the RSS feeds, and all of the social networks on our website, www.cmpod.net. You can also subscribe to our mailing list and get an update every time a new episode is available. We would love to hear your feedback and ideas for future episodes. Email us at info at cmpod.net. If you're an advertiser interested in learning more about the podcast and becoming a sponsor, contact us at info at cmpod.net. Curious Minds is written and produced by Ron Levy, hosted by me, Shoshi Shmulevitz, and Kelly O'Loughlin. Technical production by Alex Spanish. Nir Sayag is the sound editor, and Donnie Timor is our business manager. This episode was recorded at TLV1 Studios in Tel Aviv. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Bye-bye. The D 
diesel engine would suck air from the only available source. It's so horrible. <laughs> it's only funny because it's Nazis. It's just funny because it's Nazis. Like, it wouldn't be funny for anyone else. It would be sad, but you can laugh at Nazis. Like, so they called the pipe the schnork. Ugh. I, I can't do a Canadian accent. It is a Canadian accent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm out in a boot. Sorry, Canada. We love you. <laughs> Your dollar's worth worth less than. Uh, <laughs> what is it? In New York, on the back. Yeah. Pizza and bacon. <laughs> 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 <laughs>